Okay. How's it going, people? So this is going to be just a quick live. There's a couple of people that are going to hop on and they had some uh, questions for me. Um, so it's just a quick Q&A because um, I, I can't stay on too long here. I got uh, too much work to get finished. <laughs> um, but once they hop on, um, we can uh, get started with whatever those questions were. All right. So get back to my... Okay, so that one's good. What's up, Percy? How you doing, bud? I'm just waiting for them two guys that uh, I only saw one of them followed me, so I might just get one of them. Um, but you know what I got to do pretty soon? I got to start talking about Boba Fett because, dude, that show, rocking, I'm loving that show. I won't talk about it now because, you know, beautiful beard talk. Well, you know. I do try to keep it nice and I actually did uh, shave a little bit. I'm, I'm curious here. Let's get an opinion. Should I have this line like this or should I just con continue the line all the way down? What do you think? Is this little bump right here a good thing or not? Because I'm not going to I'm not going to grow the hair between here. It annoys the the, the whatever out of me because like if I eat and I feel hair, I just I don't I don't dig that. So I, this is all staying short and corners of my mouth so the this is non-negotiable for me um i usually keep this because i think it looks weird when there's just a big patch that's gone but i cannot grow hair here it doesn't grow so just saying don't continue the line naturally okay so you like how it comes to here and then it naturally goes down okay cool so that's what i'm doing so all right <laughs> all right gotta upload some documents I had a good week. Um, God was really good to me with, um, holy cow, 47 people just popped in here. What the heck? Am I that interesting in a, a little cubicle looking office? <laughs> the beer talk is, oh, that's not fair. It's funny though. That's funny. Oh, I already did upload this. I'm good to go. That's weird. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I I have no idea. TikTok's weird. Like, I'll be on playing drums, which I think is interesting, and I'll look over and I'm like, oh, 10 people. Okay, well, it just was. And I'm just sitting here not even talking about anything, and 62 people are like, what's this guy up about? But anyway, so hey, if those um if you if any of those folks that were over in Percy's live have that question, um, I was only going to stay on for just a little bit, to be honest, um, because I do need to get this done, and I need to go meet up with uh. One of my um, co-workers here and put out a little fire. Not literally. But um, but in the meantime, um, so for those of you who don't know what I do or who I am, uh, my name is Blake. I do um, discipleship style ministry, um, some teaching. Um, I don't really debate so much. I, I do discussions with people, um, but I haven't ever done formal debates. I might have one coming up soon. We'll see. But I, I would still even call that one um, just a discussion. We'll see. Um, I do. Um, I am part of a group called Men of the Way, um, and that is myself, um, Andrew Elliott, who's Andrew does apologetics on here, um, Jeremiah Short, who is Black Doctor Twenty One, and then Noel Roberts, who is Buck Rogers Two Nine Eight. Um, the four of us um, have a podcast, and we're actually going to be recording live again on Saturday, and the topic is going to be covenant theology which is cool. And I'm the weak link in the four of us on that particular topic. So I got some homework to do when I get home. Um, but uh, I'm probably going to be acting as the audience and asking them questions as they go. So I'm going to be learning during that, which is going to be awesome. Um, Jeremiah, I'm probably, maybe Andrew, um, but definitely we'll, we'll have the um, the upper hand and the knowledge because um, those guys went to seminary. I did not. I'm not a pastor. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So surprise, surprise, I actually have this uh, done and I thought I didn't. So that's good news. So 
that can go in the recycle bin. Okay. But yeah, um, uh, until those people come in, um, if there's a topic uh, surrounding Christianity, um, Calvinism, eschatology, um, what is the gospel? Um, I'm happy to answer any kind of questions that you have. We can kind of do a little bit of apologetics for a short time here. I, I do um, light apologetics, but um, nutshell covenant theology. Um, basically, it's kind of opposing dispensationalism. And what that means is that each covenant is like its own pocket. Like Israel has a covenant, they fail, covenant's dead. Next covenant, Israel fails, covenant's dead. Um, it doesn't work that way. So to believe in covenant theology means that you have the original covenant, which is the Adamic covenant with Adam, even before Eve was created, um, which um, Ad Adam was created in such a way where he was perfect and didn't have sin. Therefore, it was a works-based salvation because there was no sin, because he would have followed the law perfectly until sin entered into him. Um, so that's the very starting point. So the Edemic Covenant actually still continues even on till now. And, and we, can't do, we can't achieve it because we have sin innately in our nature. And that, of course, gets into the, the, um, the, uh, the gospel. Um, better than dispensations by a limit God sets. I'm not sure quite what you mean by that. <clears throat> but... Um, the, the thing is, is those, all, those covenants build upon each other rather than replace the one behind it. That's kind of the, that's probably a good way to nutshell it, where instead of having like isolated pocket covenants, each one actually ends up building upon the last in some way. And if you think about it, so when Jesus was building upon the Davidic covenant, because um, you had the... Um, you had the Mosaic Law, which, of course, is that's a pretty major one. Um, but the Davidic Covenant, when there were more promises made about the Messiah and Psalm and, and all of that, um, that, was, that had its own um, additions to it. And then when Jesus started talking about the law, what did he do? He said, well, you've heard it said that you should not um, sleep with another man's wife or commit adultery. I tell you that if you, if you think about doing that, you've committed adultery in your mind and in your heart. So he basically built upon that previous covenant, and he said the spirit behind it is actually even more stringent. So that was basically the new covenant or the covenant of grace which Jesus established. So it does not throw out the old law because Jesus is clear, not one dot or tittle of the old law will pass away. So it builds, it builds upon the last so that's, a, that's kind of a nutshell of covenant theology. I know I'm going to learn a lot more from Jeremiah and Andrew and probably Noel for that matter. I'm sure Noel um, studied it at, uh, at his seminary as well, even though he's not uh, a Reformed guy. I think he actually still holds to covenant theology, if I'm not mistaken. He's definitely not a dispensationalist. Um, so he's a, he's a Wesleyan Arminian, so he differs from um, Jeremiah and myself and Andrew a little bit on a couple things. Um, I don't know where he stands on eschatology so much, but um, he's Arminian. Of course, uh, three of us are Calvinists being uh, Reformed, um, which it's amazing. Isn't that great that we can all be brothers in Christ and have a couple of disagreements on secondary issues? Because that's a secondary issue. Important. So, um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> the drums are at my house. I'm at work, man. <laughs> hey, congrats on your new job, though, man. I'm super happy that um, you got something new. Um, that's exciting. Um, I know that was stressing you out working in that. It takes and it takes a very specific type of person to do um, correctional stuff. Um, and I have a friend who does. He's a big, huge, like six foot seven, three hundred, like whatever pound guy who does Brazilian jiu jitsu, and nobody really can mess with him because he's huge. He's like, he's like, hey, you need to stop doing that. And they're like, yeah, okay, all right, all right, I'll stop doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, we understand what secondary issues are and what aren't. So if it's a, if it's the gospel, those that's where it's prime issue. If it's the nature of God, the Trinity, it has to be the right Jesus and the right God. Because if you start to stray from the Bible and you say, well, I believe in Jesus and it's the Mormon Jesus. Well, that, that Mormon Jesus is in name only. It's not the real deal. That Jesus can't save you. Their Jesus is a created being who's the brother of Lucifer. That's not the biblical Jesus. So, important distinction. Is predestination by foreknowledge and why? 
So by foreknowledge, defining it like that, I would say no. Because that would mean that some kind of knowledge outside of God's power is informing him in his omniscience of something that he doesn't know and he's learning something. That's not omniscience. That's, that's known as middle knowledge, which is uh, what Molinism is based on. Um, so I don't, as a Calvinist, I do not affirm that. I, I affirm God planned everything that is happening and is ever happening from the very beginning. 666 um, is the number of Caesar Nero or Cesar Neron, if you put it in the correct language content. Um, so seeing that number does not scare me because that dude is long dead. <laughs> All right, so let's see here. So you are good. All right, so I am just about caught up here. That's pretty uh, That's pretty good for only a couple hours. All right. <clears throat> so what else you guys got? 616, yes, that is the, that would be the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Latin equivalent. Um, and you do see that variation in um, Bibles that were translated from the Latin or in Latin. Um, and I, I can't remember what it, how it's phrased, but it's it's still, of course, talking about uh, Caesar. But I don't think it's near on Caesar. Or is it near on Caesar? Yeah. it's No, it's near. Yeah, near on Caesar, I think, is, is how the 616 works in that uh, gematria. So it's a Latin gematria instead of a Jewish gematria. Yeah, it's still Nero e either way. Um, but yeah. So cool. Looks like we got another um, person that's pretty learned on um, on history there. So that's that's cool to see. Um, not everybody pays attention to that kind of thing. So that's awesome to see, man. Welcome to the the party. Near on Caesar, I was right. Okay, good. I don't have any of my stuff in front of me, so it's all just off the dome. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so let's see here. Let me make sure that I'm not missing anything, and I think I'm kind of caught up. I just got to check that all my dates are pushed to the correct times, and I will be in good shape. Fire away. Oh, yeah, hey, there's there's the guy we were waiting for. Uh, yeah, fire away. What you got? I'll do my best to uh, to answer your question there. Show Louise. Who's the fourth? Is it a worthy study? You got me on that one. I don't – I'm not familiar with that. Is that is that a historian writer? Um, because that name hasn't come up in my studies. I've I've read a lot of Josephus, uh, Polycarp, Tacitus, um, uh, Tertullian. You said America is moving away from God's law. They are. Um, so America was founded on Judaic law. To to deny that is is just to deny simple history. Um, it has nothing to do with your beliefs or our beliefs or whatever. They they did base that. Our whole legal system is based upon that, having multiple witnesses, the judge, um, innocent proven until, until proven guilty. All of those things are right out of Deuteronomy numbers and uh, Leviticus, straight out from it. Um, you, you, it's amazing. You would, you read the text and you said, this is how this should go. And you're like, oh, that's how it works here. I mean, that's incredible. It's, it is definitely like that. So what I say, what I mean by... America moving away from God's law, not necessarily the civil law that America based um, on, on the Judaic law. Um, because in Judaism, you can kind of separate um, the law as a whole into three categories. It's either civil, which really has to do with the nation, the government, how they run things that way. Um, the ceremonial, which is kind of the religious side, the sacrifices and all that. And that pretty much passed away with um, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And then there's the moral law. And the moral law is all still present, all still the same. Nine of the Ten Commandments were repeated in the New Testament. So all of that still applies. Yeah. Um, so that would be a metaphor. It's, it's not to be taken literally, just like you would anything. Um if you think that the Bible is saying there's literal pillars, what is what are the pillars sitting on? The Bible makes no indication of that. So that's just a metaphor. That's something very simple. Um, so again, so to continue to answer your question, uh, let's see, atheist I am. Um, what I mean by that is more so more the moral law. So the any the, the Sermon on the Mount is a is a great place to start. Um because Jesus laid a lot of stuff out there. If you're gonna spam the chat, I'm gonna have to I'm just gonna have to block you, man. 
Um, so I'd appreciate if you stopped doing that. I answered your question already. Um, so, so I meant metaphorically speaking, um, it, some partially perhaps, um, um, I mean more um, of the moral law. So if it says thou shalt not kill, for example, um, it actually says thou shalt not murder. So I'm, I need to clarify that because killing is not necessarily a sin depending on the circumstance. So a soldier going to war, fighting for a righteous cause, they don't have a malicious intent personally against the person that's their opponent. Um, it's, that's a different circumstance. Or let's say that there's... Um, someone on death row and there's a person that has to flip the switch on an electric chair or inject a whatever that that's not murder because it's not a malicious intent. So it's a different thing. So, but here's an example. We are murdering little children by the thousands every day in America. And for those of you that disagree with me, that's fine. But in America, we're slaughtering and tearing apart children in the wombs of, of women. That's murder. It's genocide. That one's a big one, and that's just one example. And you can kind of go across the spectrum of the moral law and say, is, is there something that we're seeing America do or commit? Um, capital punishment's debatable. Um, we'd have to get into it on that one. Um, I don't totally disagree with that, though. I'm, I'm kind of on the fence with that, that particular topic um, because the eye for an eye thing, um, the Bible says an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth and all that. And what that means is not – no, we're not trying to just pluck people's eyes out. It's that you're supposed to get a um, a proper punishment for the level of crime in which you commit it. So it's, it's justice. Um, so if you murder somebody and you go on death row, well, that, that seems to be an equivalent punishment. Um, but see, there's also mass incarceration. I shouldn't say mass, but there's just long-term incarceration, which can be problematic too. So I'm kind of, I'll get into that. Um, I actually have a, a YouTube channel I just launched, and I do intend to get into some political and civil um, discussions. Um, so I won't get into it now, but um, – but yeah, so as far as um, following the law, what I mean by that in America is the moral law. So the, the further away we stray, and really this would apply to any nation, the further that a nation strays from God's moral law, the more likely for some kind of judgment they are, and rightfully so. God, God is a good God and a just God. He's a loving God, but he's a just God, and he has to be both. Because if he didn't have love, well... He, he wouldn't be just. I mean, he gives us grace. He gave us a way to to um, be reconciled with him. But if he allows sin and he allows blatant, you know, disorder like that, well, he, he wouldn't be just. So it has to be both. Uh, I did not see your post, so let me let me scroll back and see if I can find it. Uh, started with an N. Uh, last thing you put was yes. I'm not seeing it, so you'll just need to ask again. I'm, I apologize, I missed it. Um, but I think last I am not what severely understudy. Oh, okay. Well, Jeremiah Joe was cursed or midwives. Hmm. Anyway, so everyone be fine with killing their children for being disobedient. So, good question. That's a fair question. I ran into that when I read through Deuteronomy this last month. So, that would be a civil law. That would not be part of the moral law. So consider this. The, the um, husband is the head of the household, right? They didn't have police and, and FBI and all that kind of stuff back then. Eating them? No. There was no cannibalism in, in the, the moral law. Um, now, as far as killing it, well, it is recorded in Josephus actually during the tribulation, but that's another topic. <laughs> um, but no, as far as the killing of your son, so – the, it was it was upon the fathers and the heads of the household to administer justice to their household according to God's moral law. So if it, it wasn't just for simple disobedience, it, it it had to be for specific instances, and that's laid out in Deuteronomy. It isn't just willy nilly going and killing your kid just because you want to kill your kid. If they did that, then they would be the one that was sinned, and they would actually have to be put, taken to the magistrate and charged with murder. So it wasn't just an arbitrary thing. Um, so the, the civil law of Israel had basically the, the law enforcement was each head of the household. So that's why you see um, that particular thing in uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So hope that hope that makes sense for you. 
Um, am I going to turn into Jeff Durbin on YouTube? That's hilarious. You know what though? The thing is, is, um, if I, if I am able to presuppositionally, um, discuss, um, with like Mormons and stuff as well as he does, I, I, I think that would be a positive thing. Um, so yeah. Oh, hey, Jeremiah's on. Um, I, I can't stay on too long, Jeremiah, but I'll, I'll, I'll hop, have you hop in for, for, uh, he might've heard me talk about theology and just like, what'd you say? <laughs> um, Hey brother, what's up? Hey, how you doing? I'm, uh, I'm working on, uh, just some admin stuff for work. Um, and I was on Percy's live briefly cause I couldn't resist. And, um, he had some people in his chat that had questions for me. So I said, I'd hop on here for a little bit. Um, and answered them. So, um, yeah, that's okay. basically what's going on. What you up to? Uh, just, just trying to prepare a little bit for my debate on Monday, and I'm looking just, forward to that. Um, oh yeah, I, it's going to be really, really fun. I'm just trying oh, yeah. to uh, get my thoughts in order. Um, I was going to message Noel because we were going to talk today about you know our our plan of attack, and um, I just. Hey. Why don't you uh, tell the tell the chat here what's going on with that? Um, go ahead and tell them what you're uh, debating, who you're debating, and and the time. Uh, just go ahead and plug the whole deal. <laughs> we got oh, we yeah. got like twenty something people on here, so right. Well, um, uh, myself and uh, Noel or Buck Rogers two nine eight are actually going to be debating um, alternate media Brad and alternate media Seamus on the issue of should of should Christians observe the Torah or should Christians observe the law of Moses and it's going to be on uh, Monday uh, the 31st at around eight o'clock central time and nine o'clock eastern time and we're going to be having it on the church split YouTube channel so we are um, the 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 format is going to be very similar to how um, really James White and, um, oh my goodness, uh, Dr. Brown did with Anthony Buzzard and another Unitarian and their two-on-two debate on the deity of Christ. Oh, okay. and, uh, it's, it's, I think it's going to be really fun. Some of, the, some of the workouts of how things are done have been changed or, or tweaked a little bit. But I mean, it, most of it is pretty much the same. Uh, will it so be going to be? Is it going to be like a um, opening statement, opening statement, then like rebuttal, rebuttal, and then cross exam kind of a thing? Is it is it going to be that format? Sort of. Actually, let let me just um, let me just show you or read out yeah. to you our debate format. Cool. Sounds good to me. So basically. Um, at the beginning of the debate, we each have five minutes to uh, introduce ourselves and uh, the position that we'll be representing. Um, both of us, both sides have 10 minute openings, but each side will choose how they wish to spend that time. So I'll probably have five minutes and Buck have five minutes. And um, each side after the opening statements, we'll have three questions for each other, and we'll have two to five minute responses to each one of those questions. So that's kind and of the cross exam, sort of. Oh, sort of. It, it's preparation for the cross examination. Oh, okay. Uh, I gotcha. and, and immediately after that is the cross examination period, uh, with a max of two minute responses on each side. Okay. So no one can no one can filibuster. <laughs> yeah. Someone, uh, what was the last one I, I watched James White? There were the last, I don't remember who he was debating, but the last thing I watched with James White, it was a one-on-one -on -one and someone was kind of doing that. Mm -hmm. I think it, uh, gosh, who was it? Layton Flowers? It was, what was the topic? Dang. They're all, they're all blurring together. Um, okay. It was a, it was a KJV only guy, but not um. Anderson. Um, I think I know who you're talking about, but I can't. And I think he was a Unitarian too. Yeah. Um, and he was just kind of just and he's like, "Are, are we just going to have you preach a sermon in your response to my question? And I only get one question for the whole session of the crossing." That's kind of what was happening. Long William Perkins. Maybe. 
I see. I can picture him in my mind. It was. I, I can picture the stage and everything. But what, was he? Uh, was he a kind of southern guy? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yep. That's that's Perkins. That's Perkins. Okay. That must have uh, been. You should have actually seen one of the one of his debates with uh with Sam Shamu, and that was um, that was fun. Oh, I that guy. Follow, I don't follow he's that a, anymore. He he's has, a firebrand. Um, yeah, and he's basically cut off every Protestant who ever liked him. But um, that's what I've been seeing you guys posting stuff. I'm like, bruh. Yeah, he got crazy. Uh, but yes, yeah, to, to finish up the to finish up the format, we have ten minute closing statements after the cross examination, basically the same time and same format as our opening statements, and then we have uh, a Q and A for the remaining time. Nice. Now I'll just be taken from the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. That sounds good. Set a Spurgeon beer. It might as well be. <laughs> because now, now I've decided, I mean, after having um, tried out pipe tobacco, oh, I like it. I like it a lot. I think that's going to be a, a hobby of mine. And I do like a good bourbon or sherry or not mm. so much scotch. I'm not really into scotch, but mm. I, I do kind of, I do kind of have that. Um, for me, um, well, I can speak for him too, but we're, we're both Westminster. I actually did affirm the 1689 first. And then this guy got a hold of my brain and said, well, what about this and that and this and that and this and that? And he pulled me into Westminster, which is, they're very close in many ways. Um, but I did see that the difference was correct, I think, on the Westminster. So, and I know he's a Westminster guy. Yeah, I mean, my, my path is pretty much very similar. I did affirm the 1689 when I became reformed in college. And I used to teach the 1689 in my early years of ministry. Um, but after I became a pastoral intern, um, at the church that I go to now, I started dialoguing with my assistant pastor, looked through the text myself, and I ended up becoming a Presbyterian. So, um, perfect time, <laughs> pretty much I became a Presbyterian around the perfect time for myself and, uh, my friend Chris, um, who is a reformed Baptist and we used to run a podcast at the time. It was the perfect time for us to talk about, you know, covenant theology and the distinctions between Presbyterians and uh, reformed Baptists. So that, <laughs> that fit well. Covenant theology. That sounds like a very interesting topic. Do you know of any events that are coming up that might edify us and, and teach us about covenant theology? <laughs> How facetious am I looking? <laughs> <laughs> no, I no no, I actually can't remember any. Oh, there it is. <laughs> we actually, you, me, um, Andrew, and Noel are going to be having a podcast episode uh, tomorrow on the Men of yep. Way podcast, Men of the Way podcast, and yeah. uh, we're going to be talking about covenant theology, the basics of it, the um, the covenant of works, the covenant of redemption, and the covenant of grace, um, primarily. <laughs> The covenant of grace is going to be taken from a Presbyterian perspective because most of us are Presbyterians. Um, mm -hmm. The only exception is Noel, but um, yeah, we, we don't we don't we don't talk about that. But <laughs> it, it, I think what would they call it? Really, I'm really a Presby Baptist. Is that what everybody's, or is it the other way around, like a Baptist Baptistarian? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, as well, far Noel as like worship is... goes, I do lean more the other direction. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But that's like tertiary at best, you know, so yeah. Baptist, Baptist, that's probably what uh, <laughs> Jeremiah is closest to, I'm actually, not Baptist, though, Presbyclican, I guess, <laughs> yeah, you, you have some Anglican leanings here and there, I've, I've heard you say. I mean, I, I, I do. I do. I really do have an affinity um, for the prayer book, and actually, you know, Scott is Presbyterian's. Um, often use the um, the Scots prayer book. That I did not know. Presbyterians have a prayer book, and um, cool. let's see. I'm, there there are some things that I hey, still wrestle with in relation to you know uh, the things that distinguish Presbyterian polity and um, Anglican polity. Things like um, bishops, uh, possibly things like um, like images, for example. I'm still wrestling with that issue. Um, and, and, and a few other things I've been reading. Well, I actually just finished reading John Jewell's uh, apology for the church of England. Wonderful defense of Protestantism oh, yeah. against the Roman Catholic church. And 
once I find some time, I'm going to read um, Richard Hooker's Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, where he's actually interacting with some of the uh, hardcore, non-conforming Presbyterians of his day in the Church of England. And he makes particular arguments for the episcopacy, um, church government, worship, things like that. And I think that's going to be really, really interesting once I open that up. Mario, that's a good one. Oh, my goodness. The Presglican. The Presglican. <laughs> Did you just create another denomination to divide the body of Christ, my friend? Come on. Great, man. great. Now to now, <laughs> time to add another one to the quote-unquote 33,000. <laughs> Almost uh, all of which are secondary issues. Mm, exactly. uh, maybe, that's a, maybe that's too hard a blanket statement. Let's say the ones that hold the confessions are probably mostly all secondary. Yes. The ones that don't, it, it's a mixed bag, I suppose. Exactly, exactly. Um. So, yes, yeah, so the, um. and actually I needed to ask this anyway, what actually is the best way to, um, I'll get to your question in just a second there, Atheist I am. Um, I see you there, bud. Um, so when when he streamed, he used uh, what was it? Something Yard? What was it called? That program Dream or Streamyard? Okay, so that one is where it that that's where people would go to watch first, and then it'll be uploaded to YouTube, right? It doesn't stream directly into YouTube at the same time, right? Uh, it actually does stream directly into YouTube oh. because you basically produce it, you record it through Streamyard, but it produces on YouTube. Oh, okay. um, and then once you finish, it takes a bit of time, but then it, it, it immediately uploads to uh, to YouTube. Oh, okay. Well, fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we will I'll have you send that to me, whatever um, the easiest way, because I want to make a video and, and promote it and say, hey, tomorrow we're doing this. And um, sure. So it makes it easier for everybody to plan it. I'm one of those who like I'll put something in my calendar on my phone. Like mm -hmm. I have, I have you guys this Monday thing in my phone. I'm like, okay, this time, this time. <laughs> ah, that's great. It's gonna be good. Oh, I actually, I actually do need to talk with um with Noel about seeing if we can get the um, uh, get the audio put onto Apple Podcasts so people can listen to it. I mean, I, oh yeah, I, for sure. I have for sure that'd be good. Drive from from home to uh basically from home to school every Tuesday and Thursday. So I would, I would love to be able to listen to our own stuff on the way there and on the way back just to review yeah. how it was. Yeah, that would be good. I listen to a whole lot of stuff in podcast form, like almost, almost all sermons. I don't watch the video, like all mm -hmm. of Apologia stuff. Like when uh, James White, Jeff Durbin don't do theirs. Um, mm -hmm. I have the Apologia studios um, podcast. Yeah. Um, I mean, they have a bunch of different ones. They have Apology Radio, and then they have Cultish, and they have all those yeah. other things too. But, um, but yeah, I listen to stuff on theirs all the time. That's really w where I get a lot of good stuff for eschatology, because you know, not everybody preaches on eschatology that's not pre-mill, um, pre-trib, and it's I just I don't need to hear that stuff in, <laughs> at this point, because I'm like, I'm, nope, that's crap. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> if I hear sorry for those of you theology who one more time. What's that now? I said, if I hear Kelius theology one more time, I'm going to scream. <laughs> but Mar Mario asked, where can I see it? You can see it on the um, the Wheat and Tares YouTube channel. Yep. Uh, that's uh, that's Noel's, uh, Noel's channel. Yep. That's, and then after, after his, I will have taken it from him. And then I will have up uploaded it on, onto mine as well. And mine is yeah. just eDisciple um, is my channel. Right now, the URL is MC Haas Solo. Once I get to 100 subs, I can change the URL to the to what I want. Um, that was my artist name, um, mm. back in the day here. So, um, so it'll be on mine uh, after the fact too. Probably a day or two later, I suppose. But still, um, let so me I do know how you do that, bro. Let me What's know that how you do, let me know how you do that, Blake, so I can I can put oh, it on my channel. Easy, too. yeah. Um, I just download it from uh, um Knowles, and then I just upload it into mine. It's that simple. Okay. That's all okay. I had to do. Yeah, yeah, it's super easy. Yeah, for sure. Nice. And that's why so, I asked in our Instagram chat. I was like, are we cool with that? And I mean, I, I knew everybody was going to be cool with that. I just wanted to. Because if it was under his wheat and tears and, and he wanted it to stay there, I didn't want to violate that, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Um, so I wanted, do want to answer um, Atheist Diana's question. So 
regarding mm -hmm. abortion. So if you define um, what killing is and what murder is, that's an important distinction to make because the, um, the Ten Commandments doesn't say thou shalt not kill. The implication is murder because there are instances where sadly violence is necessary and sometimes killing is necessary, but it's the motive behind it that really changes and differentiates if it's murder or not. So mm -hmm. the question would be asked and, and is, you know, you, you have a woman and she has a child in her womb. Now, I'm not of the mind that you call that anything else but a child when it's conceived. When it is one cell that has been combined with the genetic material from both parents, that is a unique DNA code with the, the color of the eyes, the color of the skin, the color of the hair. Um, all of those genetic traits are already in place, and that is a human life, even at its very smallest stage of conception. The Bible does not say it begins at birth. Um, that is that is a misnomer. There's no verse that says that that's or take the first breath or anything like that. When it's a human life, it's a human life. So right. with abortion, um, what is the general intention behind um, an abortion? Most of the time, I'm not going to make blanket statements because there are exceptions to all of these things. Generally speaking, it is. I don't want this child because it's an inconvenience for me. And I know that sounds harsh, but that's what it boils down to. I can't afford it right now. I can't do this. I can't do that. Whatever the excuse is, it is an inconvenience for that, that woman's life at the time. And I know that's harsh. And I know that there's the exceptions of things like incest and rape and all that. And those are terrible things. But here's the question. Who is the guilty party in a rape or an incest or any of those terrible things? It is not that child. It is never that child. The child right. is the result of a horrible action, sure. And, and you, we can acknowledge that. But the intention behind killing that child is inconvenience and selfishness. It has nothing to do with justice. It has nothing to do with any of the things that killing would be justified by. Therefore, right. it's murder. Might I also address two particular things? One atheist I am said made made an assertion that the Bible says that life begins at first breath and pointed to Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 that is massive eisegesis we are not made we are not explicitly created in the exact same way that Adam was Adam was made from the dust and we, and uh God breathed the breath of life into Adam, making him a living soul. That is completely different from the natural process of birth that comes afterwards. Second right. of all, I would like to I would like to put your attention to what the law says, Exodus chapter twenty one, beginning at verse twenty two. Exodus chapter twenty one, beginning at verse twenty two. When two men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out. But there is no harm. The one who hit her shall be surely fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So we see here in relation to Jewish case law that if a person is fighting, if men strive against one another and accidentally hit a pregnant woman, so much so that it actually induces birth, but the child is unharmed, so we see here, personality is already given to the child in the womb so that there is harm done in the womb that results in a difference of birth coming out. A fine is put in place. But we also see in verse 23, it's even better. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, Burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So we see That's here we that personhood and the punishment of Lex Talionis is given to the woman. Yep. The so it's clear that the they're talking about the child. Equal punishment. Not so. Not so. So the murder of a human and an abortion are actually just the same thing. 
It's just right. that you're you're probably inferring that you're talking about that someone that's already born and maybe grown up in a different develop developmental stage of life. But by definition, that's the same thing. You are killing a human life for a reason that has that has nothing to do with justice. Right. And even even consider the commentaries, even consider the commentaries. The ESV offers a traditional understanding of the text and um, and a more recent view in the footnote. The situation in view is a brawl between men. A pregnant woman nearby is accidentally hit. This results in either a premature live birth or a miscarriage where the child dies. This much is clear, but the interpreters disagree on the exact meaning of the Hebrew term traditionally rendered, there is no harm. <clears throat> According to the traditional view, harm is suffered either by the woman or her baby. Depending on the extent of the loss, the death of the baby, or injury of the baby, an injury to the mother, the man who caused the injury shall pay as the judges determine, presumably according to the eye-for-eye eye principle, as the preceding and following laws show. Eye-for-eye eye was not taken literally. It was simply a formula for proportionate punishment or compensation. Proportionate it, punishment. Exactly. Well stated. Yep. One implication, however, is that the death of the baby <laughs> seems to be judged according to the same principles that apply to the taking of another human life. For example, the death of the mother. The alternative view understands the obscure terms quite differently. This view presupposes that the baby has died and the issue is who is to pay the penalty for the death of the baby and the injury of the mother. In a fight, it may not be obvious who's responsible for the damaging blow. If the offender is edifiable, identifiable, he alone must pay for the loss of life. The, if, if the offender cannot be determined, the community, uh, the community shall pay. This principle also applies to compensation for injuries the woman may have suffered. By either interpretation, old or new, the Old Testament attri attributes human personhood to the developing baby in the womb. So um, he had asked in the chat here, um, there, there was a question asked about what about God committing abortion? So I'd, I'd like you to define that and show us where that is, because we need to read it in context, like any scripture, um, and we need to see what it is you're referring to. And if that's the case, um, the next question I would then ask is, is by what moral standard are you holding God to? Right. So if you can if you can show us um, the verse or um, a, chapter a or wherever that is, we're happy to look at. Um, I'll have to depend on Jeremiah because I don't have my Bible in front of me. <laughs> but um, sure, sure. Yeah, we can certainly look at it, it. This is something that people always always try to bring up in relation to. Um, I think one of it's. I believe it's in Deuteronomy. Sure. Um, let's see. It's about testing a woman whether or not they have committed adultery. Um, um, oh, I'm really surprised that I'm as caught up as I am. I thought, uh, <laughs> I thought this day was going to be a lot more difficult, but it, it, it's been pretty smooth here getting stuff done. It's always a nice thing. Right. Those days where you start something and then you something else comes up and you have to do that and then you never get back to what you were originally wanting to get done. Oof, those are frustrating days. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, since, um, since we're kind of in a lull waiting for, um, for him to come back with that, um, I do want to plug my YouTube channel. <laughs> um, so I did just launch um, or relaunch my YouTube channel. I've got a lot of videos on there now. Um, it's in like the hundreds now. Um, I am going to be, um, I, I have a lot of categories, so I've, cre I've created a bunch of playlists. Um, my entire Gandalf um, reading Proverbs, I've called it the um, uh, the Young Gandalf Wisdom Series. Um, so it's basically cosplay <laughs> uh, Gandalf reading Proverbs. Um, so if you think that's cool, then awesome, go take a look. Um, I also have um, a category that's comedic, so it's um, Christian memes and comedy. Um, so all of my Dragon Ball Z like meme style. Uh, videos are, are uploaded there. Um, I have I have a channel set up or not a channel, sorry, a playlist for eschatology, um, soteriology theory or uh, theology and doctrine, um, refutations and kind of debate stuff. 
Um, so I have um, all of these categories set up and I'm trying to port all of the videos I have from TikTok and other sources of lives um, into YouTube. So it's, it's organized and you can go and look at stuff. So when someone asks me a bunch of eschatology questions, I'm like, what you're asking would take a lot of time to explain. Why don't you head over to um, my eschatology playlist and you can look at the titles and, and go through it and it's just a way easier format. Um, YouTube is definitely superior to TikTok in its organization because I think you have to have 100,000 followers to get those little folder tabs, which is kind of preposterous. Why? Why can't you let just let people organize their videos? <laughs> but eh, that is what it is. Right. <laughs> like yours, wouldn't it be nice to have a playlist folder that's like the heresy series? And you can go, okay, you can just go right through them and, and see all the different heresies and there they are. You know, well, be nice. Well, you you just you just have to be special. You have to be special on TikTok in order to get it. You just right. You just have to be liked. Yeah, and that's not what some of us are here for. Some of us are here for what I would say are our higher causes. I would I would say. Exactly. Hey, Hokage's here. How you doing, Sahil? Glad you're back. I know, right? Yeah, I didn't know how long he'd be gone, but he came back up uh, that beard is heresy. <laughs> this threatens the gospel in some way, really? Does it? Okay, well, I disagree, and you, you need to show me the verse on that one, too. Right. Because most of the stuff talking about beards is actually having a lot of beard in the Bible. <laughs> well, I didn't see um I didn't see him come back with a a a verse. He hasn't yet, so, but I think I know where he's going. Because the, the really one, probably uh, num uh, specifically number oh, five. Number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a test of adultery. There's it, it's easy to say this because for those of us who do lives and do any kind of apologetic kind of stuff, you'd really mm -hmm. be amazed. Oh, that's okay. You're cool, man. Um, you'd be amazed how often we hear the same arguments. And some of them are fine. Like when someone asks a legitimate question that's just really one of those tried and true questions and they're honestly asking, no problem with that. But like the typical like R slash atheism, like, you know, the translations are debunked because it's a translation on a translation on a translation. Like if you did like this much research, that's it's clear that that's not true at all. So and the person I hope most you know, at all. is Joe Rogan, because I think he's a really smart guy and he's usually very intellectually honest. But when it comes to to religion in general, but Christianity specifically, he has the worst shut down things to say, and it's just dismissive. And then he just goes, "Nope," and he won't even listen to anything. That that's a bummer because yeah. he has such a big platform. And if he had some people on that, you know, would talk about it and like educated people that could really answer his questions and he really searched it out i'd really be interested to see what he what he sees right because if he's truly intellectually honest and he's seeking truth you know what i mean you never know you never know what the holy spirit might do huh he does some awesome stuff all the time exactly Paul wrote the case. Yeah, if the KJV is good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. Exactly. All I gotta say, Lord's English, uh -huh. be thou then thine, all that. Uh -huh. <laughs> and tell that to James White and have him go, bruh. Exactly. I wrote a book. I think I might have wrote multiple books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anywho, well, I am probably going to have to skedaddle here. I got to go meet up with my coworker, and we got to figure out um, a couple things with one of our jobs. So I am probably going to head on out of here. So thanks for hopping on here, Jeremiah. Um, I'll probably be talking to you later today. Of um, course not. Because, yeah, I want to ask you about what I need to uh, study, what homework I need to do before our live tomorrow. I listened to a couple sermons this morning, uh, R.C. Sproul, which uh, people say he's all right. Um, and then I listened to uh, a Jeff Durbin um, talking about some covenant theology. His was, it's funny because he, he started going into eschatology. He just can't resist. <laughs> he just can't resist. Of course. <laughs> but um, I'm going to read a couple of things. Um, I, I wish I had, um, is it systematic theology? R.C. Um, Sproul? Um, theology. Um, 
what is Reformed theology, but you also have your, well, you have your Reformed study Bible, which. I do. Um, yeah. And I there's, will, there is a section there I'm going to look at. Well, sure. that's, that's, that's one of the things I'm going to go over in our, um, in our episode. So if you awesome. want to look over some of that, we will be covering that. But um, Atheist I Am actually did come up with a passage. A oh, passage Isaiah. Okay. Where, we can stick around for a second and take a look for sure. Yeah. Let's, this let's, is, um, let's look it up. I, I just find this this odd because this is this the the context of Isaiah is specifically judging Babylon. It is a prophetic, um, yep. a prophetic hyperbole a lot of times too, and it's apocalyptic mm-hmm. literature. So we have to take that into account. The literary style of what book you're reading matters immensely, immensely. <laughs> I mean, I'll start at verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, and to make a land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light, and the sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. We see this multiple times Yep. in, in relation to prophetic utterances about the judgment of a nation. It doesn't a day of the mean, Lord. Right. The day of right. the Lord is almost always a judgment passage. And it's saying that this is it, it will be it will feel like the, the the day of the Lord is coming to you because these things are signs of the day of the Lord. It, it is it is it is pointing to in physical destruction. There will be a coming day where all evil will be destroyed. And so it says here in verse um Verse 13, therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the great day of his anger. And like a haunted gazelle or or like a sheep with none to gather them, each will turn to his own people and each will flee to his own land. So this is this is describing this situation as a place of fear. And whoever is found will be thrust through and whoever is caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Behold, I am serving up the Medes against them, who have no regard for silver and no delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men, and they will have no mercy in the fruit of the womb, and their eyes will not pity children. So we see here, even in this passage of judgment, it is a terrible thing to kill children in the womb. To have no regard for children. This is not a positive affirmation of the murder of children. It is an affirmation that the murder of children is disgusting and reprehensible to God. So I got another one for you with that. So here's something to consider with with judgment. So when we see judgment upon a nation, if it's not an actual like supernatural event, like the locust plagues and other things in Egypt, What do we actually see God doing? Do we see God actually taking his hand and doing something with a group and controlling them in some way? It's actually the opposite. God is holding back the tides of our depraved, crazy chaos. If we were actually, if God took his hands off of the world and human beings right now, we would have nuked ourselves decades ago. He is holding back the tides of sin in such a way. And when judgment occurs, he pulls back however much he chooses to and allows judgment upon something and then settles it again. We say, see that exact thing talked about in Matthew 24. Again, we're going right back to eschatology. We see that talked about that if God hadn't hold, held back, so many more would have died. It's right in the middle of Matthew 24. I, I'm going to quote it wrong because I don't have it in front of me. But that is a very important thing to think about is that God is actually holding back the tides of the chaos that humans would commit in atrocities. He's holding that back. And if he were to let go, it'd be far, far, far worse. Like it would make World War II and the stuff that happened in Germany uh, Germany look like a cakewalk. Exactly. And I bet that most of these passages that you're bringing up 
are probably going to be along those similar kind of lines. I'm I'm speculating here because again I don't know my no Bible. no no I, I'm I'm actually looking these up as they're going along and really the only thing that he's providing is quote unquote genocide passages, which of sure. course if you actually understood ancient Near Eastern language, it is commanding not actual genocide because these cities come up later on in the narratives. What they are discussing is having a decisive victory over the enemy. This is mm -hmm. typical um, ancient Near Eastern language for the nation was wiped out, meaning that they were unable to fight. We defeated them succinctly. It doesn't mean that every single thing within it was destroyed and these things were wiped off the face of the earth. Because as I now said were before, these nations there were exceptions to that. In fairness, there um, is it the Canaanites that that he actually did say to Israel to, to to kill the livestock and all of that. If I'm not mistaken, well, that that's the same language. the The purpose is oh. to drive them out of the land, to drive I them see. out, because the people I of see. Canaan come back later. Gotcha. Oh, fair enough. Well, there you have it. Yeah. Well, cool. And, so and, sorry and, we couldn't really answer this, all of your. All of your passages there. Um, I don't know if, if Jeremiah wants to uh, do a live himself. Um, I do have to, to hop off here in a second here, but um, um, definitely give him a follow because when you have these deep questions, especially when it's about church history and, and all that kind of thing, um, he's kind of the resident guy to go to um, that we all ask. Um, so give him a follow. And, if, you know, if he chooses to go live, uh, uh, maybe he can continue on the conversation with uh, with that question. So, um yeah, anyway, um, so yeah, thanks again for hopping on, Jeremiah. I appreciate it. Um, thank mm -hmm. you for all in the chat, um, asking questions and engaging. Um, so I'm going to take off. Uh, God bless you guys, and uh, have a great day. Take care. Take care.